like this. Inshallah, these are those little dynamites. These are those little pebbles that Hazrat Dawud picked up. Do you remember Hazrat Dawud See these Palestinians again. The Palestinians and the Arab and the Jews have been having it out for more than 3,000 years. They're fighting, fighting, fighting. And you read in the Bible, and they were destroyed utterly. Vanished. And they come back from nowhere, like ghosts, the Palestinians. And they destroyed them utterly, and they come back again. I don't know where they found. The Bible says, and they destroyed them utterly, and they're back again. And they destroyed them utterly, and they're back again. Amazing, these Palestinians, you know, they never go out of circulation. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So now comes the time that the Palestinians, they have a giant in their midst. Goliath, Jamut. And according to Guinness Book of Records I was reading today, that according to the biblical, this thing, he was nine foot six. About that height of more, nine foot six. It was nine foot six. A bit of an exaggeration, but nine foot six. Now, once you have a guy like that in your midst, naturally you feel that now we can battle anybody. So this Jalut from a hilltop, he cries out to the Bani Israel on the opposite hill. Say, hey, you Jews, is there anybody there who will take me on? I'll chew you alive. And the Bani Israel were shivering in their pants. I don't know if they used to wear pants those days, you know. But figuratively, they were shivering in their pants. Nobody, nobody wants to come forward. So little Dawood is there. He is looking after his father's sheep. So he sees the opportunity. Man, this is a fantastic target. This is a sitting duck. Big giant. Eight foot giant. This is a nine foot six. No man, seven foot. This guy is slow, cumbersome. You know, when you're a giant, abnormal. He is not even steady on his feet as if he's drunk. He's not drunk. But the size, cumbersome. He can't control himself. He's an easy target, man, for his sling. And his mouth waters. What an opportunity. Shh. So he comes to Talut, Saul. He say, I'll take him on. So what? You go and look after your father's sheep. The young man is enthusiastic. He says, no, man, you don't know. This guy here is so easy to knock him over. Talut couldn't resist his enthusiasm. He said, all right, here. Here's my sword and my shield. So little Dawood says, look, I, don't, I haven't handled this in my life before. Maybe it's also too heavy for him. He said, look, I know my sling, that old-fashioned sling. There was no rubber those days. They hadn't discovered rubber then. It's a pouch with two strings. You put a stone in the middle and you swing. Gain momentum and let go one side. And if you are used to it, you know how to hit your mark. That old-fashioned sling. We call it in India, we call it Gopan. So what? Bigger joke. It was a bigger joke. Now with a toy. This is a toy. So I said, all right, if you want to commit suicide, go. So he walks down the hill and at the stream he picks up a few pebbles. These are those pebbles. These booklets are those pebbles. With these pebbles, you master these, and you can crack the jalut, crack the jalut skull. 
the missionary, this bishop, archbishops, whoever they are, with this knowledge here, you can crack his skull. So this is the advice I wanted to give to you. Get these little pebbles and go to town. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, if there are any questions on what I have spoken so far or anything allied to what I have said, you are at liberty to ask. Questions? Of course, if you haven't got questions, that we are all converted, I can get back quicker to Birmingham. <laughs> Yes, my son. It's not about today's subject. It's about the, uh, why the Christians don't allow people to marry more than one wife. When in Leviticus 1818, it is allowed to marry more than one, one wife as long as the wife of the wife's sister or the wife's mother. And Jesus said not to, uh, he, he came to Alice and his son, not to, not to change the law. So, uh, the question was, how is it that there in the Old Testament there is an injunction given that you can marry women, more than one, as long as they are not your sisters or your mothers or your daughters and things like that. Restrictions are given, but they were allowed to marry more than one. And the prophets, as we read in the Old Testament, almost each and every one of them had more than one wife. How is it? And Jesus Christ didn't condemn polygamy, not in the least. How is it that the Christians are today saying that only one man, one woman? That is the question. Now the thing is, this is their own creation. The Christian world up to almost yesterday, they practice polygamy. Now Allah doesn't tell us to go and have two or three or four. But there are circumstances in life when it is necessary to protect womanhood. Like I was giving reference, I don't know whether it was last night or at the meeting that this is a solution to your problem, more especially the West. In America, at the present moment, there are 7.8 million more women than men. Almost 8 million women. At the present moment, there are 20 million women in America without husbands. 20 million. But even if every man in America got married, there will be 7.8 million women left without husbands. What is the solution? The answer. We are asking them, provide the answer. Here in England, soon after the war, there was a news item that on the east coast of England, there were 1.6 million more women than men on the east coast alone. Over, over Britain, 4 million more women than men. In Britain, if every man gets married, there will still be 4 million women who can't get husbands. And soon after the war, a news item, dateline from London, I was reading in my country, it said 5,000 misfits to be shipped to America. You know, the human mind is so imaginative that when you read something, you think you got the whole picture. So I'm imagining that these misfits must be cripples with hair lip, with club foot, that they are going, being sent to America for treatment. That's the imagination. Thinking that America medically is far more advanced than Britain. That's what I'm thinking. But when I read further, the, item, the news item said that these 5,000 misfits were the offsprings of Negro soldiers stationed in England during the war. They were the offsprings of Negro soldiers. That they were too dark, too black to be absorbed in the English society. These Negro children, to these British girls. That in your home, if you had this little, one of these little ones, and with crinkly hair and stubbed nose, he says, now who's this? He said, my sister Mary's child. Everybody comes around, who's this? This is my sister Mary's child. It's like a dagger in your heart. So what do you do with things like that? Ship them to America, to be joined with the Negro Society in America. So they send them. Maybe Andrew Young was one of those. Maybe Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali might have been one of those. We don't know. But this is 5,000 misfits were shipped to America. They were not, they couldn't be fitted into British society. So I am asking the question that these 5,000 misfits, how did they come about? How many Negro soldiers were in England during the course of the war, compared to the whites? The white Australian, the white New Zealander, the white New South African, the white Free French, the white Poles, and on, and the white British, and the white American, the white Canadian. How many blacks were there? A handful. Compared to the white soldiers, a handful. So what amount of adultery, fornication was committed in Christian England to produce us 5,000 misfits, misfits during the course of the war? What amount? 
you tell me, to create all these illegal children. How many? Thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, they, you created them. So Islam gives a solution to a problem. It's not a tonic, being offered as a tonic, Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, no, no. This is a remedy, answer, a solution to a problem. And on BBC TV, some years ago, there was a program. The program was about polygamy. So they brought a group of women, asking them one by one, what do you think, madam? So a woman gives a point of view, says, mm, oh, my dead body, I'll never allow my husband to have another wife. And you, madam? He said, well, you see, if the man will look after me and my children, I don't mind sharing a husband. And you, madam? Never. And you, madam? So by the time the program was over, half an hour gone. So these organizers, they got those women again. So what kind of women were they, those who didn't mind? And what kind of women were those who opposed it to the nail? So they brought the same team back again onto the program. Now, madam, are you married? I said, yes. Do you mind sharing a husband, your husband with another woman? I said, never. You, are you married? No. You mind sharing a husband? I said, no, I don't mind if I get somebody to look after me and my children. Right. It was 50-50. Those who had, they said they won't share. Those didn't have, they didn't mind sharing. So it's a question of haves and have nots, you see. Vested interest. But otherwise, it is a solution to a problem. Yes, any other question? Yes, ma'am. What can we do to combat Christian missionary activities in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Lebanon, and the Islamic countries? The only way you can meet these forces is to study the textbooks. There is no other way. See, Allah Ta'ala gives us the secret. The secret is, Allah says, Kul hatu burhanakum. Whenever anybody makes a claim, they're making a claim, they say, Waqalu, they say, Lan yadkhul al jannata illa man kana hudan aw nasara. That you Muslims will never, never enter jannat. There's no heaven for you. Unless you become a Jew, or unless you become a Christian. That's a claim then, that's a claim now. Though the Jews have fallen out of the race, they only want political recognition. They are not interested in converting you. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. They want you to accept them that Palestine, you give it to them, there will be peace between us and them. Because our is not a racial war, it is not a religious war. Our battle with the Jew is for that piece of land which they have stolen from our brethren. That's our battle. They're not interested in converting us. But the Christian we know, they're making a mess out of the Muslim world. They have perverted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than in the 150 years of British rule. They converted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence than in the previous 150 years of British rule. They have converted 15 million Indonesians into Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Indonesia a Christian nation. And there are every sign that they will succeed. The answer to this problem is that you have to master his book. Allah says, when they make any claim, it is tilka amani yuhum, that this is their wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. We say, bakwas, bakwas, babbling, babbling. Don't be afraid of them. Pull! Tell them how to burhan. Produce your proof, your burhan. In kuntum swadikin, if you are speaking the truth, let's have a look at your certificate that entitles you to heaven and destines us to hell. Let's have a look at it. Did you do that? No. 1,000 years, 1,400 years, have you been asking them for the Burhan? No. I want to know why. I'm asking the Arabs, how is it that you read this and you didn't do the job? 1,400 years, the Muslims is supreme in Egypt. 1,400 years. And today they are boasting that 10 million Coptic Christians there. In Egypt, 1,400 years, you had a good evening. And in 1,400 years, you could make a dent in the Christian community? Why? Simple reason. You didn't ask for this Burhan. And unless you ask for this Burhan, you can't talk. There's no way you can open the subject with them. They already have program, brainwashed to say, Christ died for the sins, salvation is yours. You can sweat it out five times a day. You can pray, fast for one whole month. These are all like filthy rags, he says. Rubbish, worthless rubbish. He says, salvation only comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus. Once you accept that, all our philosophy, psychology, logic, it won't make a headway. You've got to break through. And the only way you can break through is Kul hatu burhanakum. Let us have a look at your burhan, your proof. And when you see that, you'll find it's all hocus pocus. 
You can find, you can go to town, you can cr crack his skull. He hasn't got a thing. Wallah, he hasn't got a thing. And there isn't Christians born who can stand before you if you only master these little pebbles, these little booklets. And each and every Muslim should be going and doing his job. You don't wait for Ahmad Didat or Sheikh bin Baz or so-and-so or Sheikh. This is every Muslim's duty. According to your capacity, just learn these things, master them, and go to town, man. It's the privilege Allah has given you and me. He's given you a deen that's to master, overcome, and supersede them all. That's what Allah says. This is the destiny of his deen. Walau karihal mushrikun. Say, now mind how the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. Master them all. You believe in it? You believe in it? Yes. I will hear. Yes, yes. That's why you're sitting on your backside doing nothing. Yeah? You're doing nothing. You sit on your backside doing nothing. They believe what you believe. You don't really believe. That's the trouble. We say we believe. We don't really believe. How? Yes, my son. Yes, in a debate, you put Ali Saroj in a political perspective. Now, if you look at the uh, history and analyze the facts, all Palestinians killed by so-called Arab leaders than by the Israelis. More of the suppression is coming from our Arab leaders. If I was to call for Islam in Iraq, I'll be put into prison. If I was to call for Islam in Syria, I'll be hanged. So can you comment on that subject, please? <laughs> You're talking about politics. <laughs> you see, our battle was, our battle was the Quran or the Bible. That was the subject of the debate, the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word. And in that battle, this Palestinian Christian has already sold out. That's that's for you to now go and fight them out. You go and fight them now, you see. see. My battle is with the guy who is coming along and knocking at my door. Talk to him, how to talk to him. Yes, Ben? Were there any Muslims existing during the time of the internet? What happened? Were there any Muslims existing during the time of the internet? Uh, the question is, were there any Muslims existing in the time of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, in the time of Jesus? Is that the question? Yes. You see, Anyone who hearkened to the message of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim and his religion was Islam. There was no such thing as Christianity. The teachings of the church where they say that Jesus is God is not his teaching. He never preached any such thing. He is telling his people that they must be better than the Jew. Unless you are better than the Jew, the Jew who was just formalistic, he was keeping the letter of the law, forgetting the spirit. He says, there is no heaven for you. That's his teaching. He's telling them, come, I will teach you how to pray. Pray like this. And he's teaching them. He said, oh, our Father, which art in heaven, God Almighty, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the prayer that he taught. He didn't say the Father of Jesus Christ in heaven or me, Jesus who's in heaven. He's talking about the Father in heaven. So, in other words, he was preaching nothing but Islam. Churches is quite a different thing altogether. It's not his teaching. They are their own creation. But anyone who followed Musa alayhi salam was a Muslim. Anyone who followed Isa alayhi salam was a Muslim. But these people have now deviated. They have deviated from the teachings of Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. Yes, brother. You had a question here. Well, this is uh, a <coughs> book of yours, the Quran, the ultimate miracle. Well, I'm a cassette of it. The CNS, uh, whenever I try to show it to our uh, mullahs, you know, they don't accept it and they don't believe in it. Uh, would you please? Uh... Uh, there was a book I had written, Al Quran, the Ultimate Miracle. I had delivered talks on the subject, and there were videotapes and cassettes available. But this man, who originally made the discovery, which I found useful in talking to Muslims and non Muslims, but this man, a sickness has developed. Now he's claiming to be a new Rasulullah, like what Baha'u'llah was at one time, and Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. This is a sickness, this is a sickness that is quite common. You see, once a person, you know, he finds that he's so clever, that people are, you know, hero-worshipping him. And, you know, whatever I say, I know these people will believe. So the man creates a sickness, this man I can make claims. Today, this guy called Rashad Khalifa, he is the man who discovered this theory, Ali Hati Satasha. Now he said he is a new Rasul, he is a messenger of God. There are certain flaws in the theory, 
But besides that, now he's claiming now, on the basis of that discovery that he is Rasulullah, and now he came out to prove first was that the Quran is Allah's kalam, not changed, not one letter is changed. Now through the same theory he's proving, he's trying to prove that, look, the Quran is changed. That there are verses in the Quran which are not supposed to be there. Astaghfirullah. So I challenge this man to a debate. I send him a telegram that I am prepared to hire the Madison Square Garden in New York at my expense. I said, you Khabis from Tucson, come over. And he says, I have proved to the world that you are a kazab, a liar, and a cheat, and a false. False guy. So he says, no, I don't want to come to the Madison Square Garden. You come to Tucson. In private, he wants to have a discussion. I said, look, you're rubbish. There's no time for me to talk to people in private. Come, come. You are the true messenger of God. Then come forward, man. I'm prepared to talk to you. So I have discontinued with the tape as well as the book and the cassette. No more. I have no more book, no more video, no more cassette. Finish. There's so much more there. We don't want to create you know, unnecessary strife among the Muslims. And that guy, every time I'm speaking, he's trying to capitalize upon that. So he's trying to win your sympathy that he is a new messenger of God. Finish. We got nothing to do with him. He is an imposter and a liar and a cheat and a kazaar. Discontinue. Finish. No more. Yes, my son. Yes, there. That's right. White shirt. White shirt. Yes, you white shirt. Yes. You see, the Gospel of Barnabas, it mentions our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by name. That Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, he prophesied about the coming of another messenger whose name will be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But now this book is not recognized by the bulk of Christendom. They say it's a forgery. They say this is not authentic. Now, the Muslim is wasting his time. Because Allah commands us to demand proof by asking the Christian or the Jew or whoever, Kul hatu burhanakum. Produce your proof. And they have produced the proof. The Bible. Nobody produced Barnabas to you, did they? No. So talk about what he's proof. What he's claiming to be true. Talk about that. And once you do that, get these booklets of mine, you won't need Barnabas. These booklets will do the job with his Burhan. The Prophet said, I came to confirm what will be my hand from Tawrah and Injil. So what is Injil? And was the revelations and was the Jesus fine? Or after that being written. The Injil is the Wahi, the revelation, which Allah gave Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. Whatever He gave to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, that is the Injil, the Wahi. Where is it? You ask that to the Christians. Where is it? Because the Gospels, the so called Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all say that Jesus went to a certain place and he preached the gospel. Gospel means Injil. He went somewhere else and he preached the gospel. He went somewhere else and he preached the gospel. Every book says he went and preached the gospel. Injil, 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 Injil. So we are asking, did he have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John under his arm? Is that what he was preaching? No. Where is that Injil which he was preaching? That is what Allah gave him. So whatever Allah gave him is the truth. But they haven't got it. As the mention about the book, the Bible, is red letter Bible, I said 21, the one in which Sharosh gave me, 21 out of 27, there's not even a red letter dot or dash supposed to be of Jesus. <laughs>